Leslie, thank you so much for uh, coming here today and talk about something that's kind of special to me and my family. Uh, um, I'm a little embarrassed to say that Casa has been on my heart for many years, and it's taken me uh, a long time to come around to put my yes on the table for it. So today we're here talking about Casa and what Casa means to our community and to the uh, the, the kids in our community. Can you uh, just kind of give us a 10,000 foot view of what Casa actually is and Kind of I'll, I'll give it my best shot. Okay. Um, CASA stands for Court Appointed Special Advocate. And what we do is we train community volunteers to speak up for children in foster care due to abuse and neglect. So many times, so many things change. These children are pulled out of their home of origin and placed in a different home. They're, so all of their surroundings have changed. They're um, everything they know and love, regardless of what their situation was, that was their home. That was what they felt comfortable with. And so many things changes. Their attorneys change. Their their placement changes. Their caseworkers change. And we ask for this volunteer to stay with this child, to stay with this case for the duration of the time that they're in care. So when a child enters the system, we're going to refer to the system as foster care system. So state of Louisiana has come in and said something is not right, something that the child is not being cared for in, to give basic needs for, for the kid. Uh, they enter into the system. Um, and at some point in history, it was recognized that somebody needs to really fight for this kid. Somebody needs to be able to be that voice for this child, correct? Correct, So yes. they, they are. they do have their own attorneys, but if, if people could imagine – these are not like private hired attorneys. These are attorneys that have massive caseloads um, that, Absolutely. I mean, frankly, they even if they wanted to, probably don't have the time to invest in that child's life to truly find out what's best for the kid. So uh, can you go back and, and tell us how CASA was originally formed? Give us a little back history on that of why someone thought – that it would be great to have a community member to speak on behalf of the kid? It started by Judge Sokoop in Washington, in Seattle. And he had a case before him, and he just felt like he had all these different views. And he didn't know what was the right avenue for this child. And he thought that if he had an unbiased opinion, someone who was not a family member, someone who was not a caseworker, someone who was not an attorney, that he could probably make a better decision on what it was best for this child. And that is where CASA was formed. We've been in Northeast Louisiana for over 20 years, actually like 22 years. And we cover 11 parishes in Northeast Louisiana. And that's what we do. We step up and we offer hope when things seem so dark and so bleak for these children. When um, we got involved through um, our church, so our church has got a really big push on, um, well, we've always kind of had the push, but it's, you know, it's those things we need to be reminded of. Um, we're called as Christians to um, to help the widows and the orphans. And we have a lot of foster families within our church. And fostering is not right for everybody. It is a, a huge commitment. Yes. A very huge commitment. But there are other ways that people can actually serve. And when uh, CASA was brought up again, I'm like, you know, this has got to be something that's worth looking into. So our class, our life group, Sunday school class got together and said, well, look, let's see if we can just just at least go through it and see what it's about. Let me tell you, my eyes were open to a need greater than I ever anticipated. What is the um, how many kids do we have in roughly in the foster care system in northeast Louisiana right now? Um, last count was um, four. 37, something like that. So over 400 kids in the foster care system. Washtenaw Parish itself is the number four parish in the state of Louisiana with well, the number of children in foster care. And when you look at that and, and think of comparing our parish to, you know, the Shreveport area, to uh, Alexandria, to New Orleans, to Baton Rouge, to uh, Lake Charles, to Lafayette, there's a lot of parishes that are way bigger than us. Absolutely. And we have a great need here. We have a great need here. So out of the 400 kids that are in foster care, how many 
of those kids approximately have a CASA caseworker or a CASA volunteer? I believe we at right at 149, I believe, was the number I looked up so last week. So around 150 kids are represented by CASA, but we have over 400 that are in the system right now. So that means the balance of those kids, they do not have someone that's stepping up to speak on their behalf. That's true. Now, not all children are offered a CASA. That is up to the judge presiding over that case, whether they want to assign CASA to that case or not. If they feel like it's going to be something that they need a another opinion. Okay. So um, right now we have but I would think that it's, uh, I mean, even though we're looking at it from a standpoint that there's a need, we could kind of get lost in, you know, actual stats, but the need is still great and it is still strong. I mean, we, we there's a, a desperate need for people to speak on behalf of these kids. Oh, yes. All, all over Northeast Louisiana. Yes. So you can't have enough volunteers to help in this area we have a waiting list of children Mm. what i would love to have is a waiting list of volunteers waiting to serve these children so talk to us a little bit about um what type of what type of situations and i know every case is going to be different every single case is going to be different um when we went through the class let me tell you you guys uh, you can tell y'all have done this for a long time it's like a well old machine running through the uh, uh, the class, and but you guys really take the time to educate us in a way to where we feel we feel confident that we can walk through this, even though there's a sense of um, uh, nervousness about you know stepping outside of your comfort zone. Absolutely. Because we all have these uh, preconceived fears that may come in that I'll be. I'll have to go to places that are not like the place that I'm, I'm used to go. And I'll have to see things that's happened to children that I'm not used to being able to see or have conversations that might be a little uncomfortable. <clears throat> but so far, my experience hasn't been that at all. My experience so far has been eye-opening. Um, my experience so far has been there's hope in humanity. Uh, and my experience has been, wow, I need to take this serious because this kid is counting on what I have to say in representation to, to the judge or the court. I mean, it's, it's a huge responsibility, but so far I've been very fulfilled and rewarded for, for doing it. So tell us about some of the situations that the average case would kind of uh, entail. Most of our cases, the children are removed due to um, substance abuse. So a lot of times these children are removed um, in the middle of the night with just a Walmart bag full of of what they can grab and take with them and get out of that situation. Um, So that is a lot of what we're dealing with. We, um, We ask our volunteers to meet all the players in the game, meet the foster parents, the biological parents, any family that might be considered as placement for these children during this time. Um, we, Our volunteers have a court order that allows them to talk to the school, talk to the counselors, talk to the doctors, to find out to, they are fact gatherers. And they gather these facts and present them to the judge so that judge can make the most informed decision about what is best for that child. And our volunteers are not walking through this alone. We've got a staff member that's paired with each volunteer that walks right beside you that will be your sounding board, be your your emotional support, and give you guidance on what your next step should be. And so you're not out there alone, but it is, I I was a volunteer before I took this position and (coughs) it is the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Well, I I liken it to the, uh, the, it's, we call them supervisors. Um, You know, you get assigned a supervisor and they're not walking beside you. They're holding your hand. They are. Your hand is held the entire time going through the process. And there's gentle nudges that sometimes need to happen because sometimes we don't know. You don't want to come across as a volunteer um, 
um, too assertive, but you need to be assertive enough. So that, that supervisor is really kind of coaching you through some of this. And um, I, I talked about hope and humanity before. A lot of times we have as just everyday individuals that go to work and enjoy life that are not struggling with whether it be substance abuse or mental health issues, I right. think is another uh, concern that's out there, or domestic abuse that we may not be in that world. So we come in with sometimes a preconceived notion of, you know, why would we want to work to stick a child back where they came from and all this was going on? But my experience so far is these kids, they love their mama. They do. They love family. And I don't care what the house looks like, um, what the smells are, how the clothes are, the amenities they have or don't have. That kid wants to be home with mama. Every and time. It, every time. And it really kind of it affected me trying to understand that we put sometimes in life our biases that are out there that say this is right or this is wrong. But when you start talking about love, and comfort when we start trying to define that for someone else i think we get in the way of seeing how life is really supposed to work what works for me is not going to necessarily work for someone else but the goal is we need to reunite the family because that is uh, best for society uh, it's best for the kids as long as that family can be in a situation to where they can get take care of basic needs for that kid and in my case specific that I'm seeing where we have a lack of uh, um, fathers in the home, I'm actually seeing things happen with biological father to where I didn't – when I read that first case, I'm like, yeah, I, I can see where this is going, and it's just like it's not going that way. And, and, again, it's another one of those biases you come in and say that, you know, if you give someone an opportunity – I know there's a lot of opportunities in life that people will just let go by. But when you give an opportunity, that's a chance. That's hope. That's an opportunity for someone to make a change. And I'm sure you've got success story after success story of where that's happened. But in the same, in the same line of that, I'm sure there's a lot of disappointment that happens as well. There is. But the success story that you're talking about um, far outweighs <laughs> the times that it didn't go the way we felt it should go. Um, our number one goal is always reunification yeah. of the family. That is not always possible. Sure. But so many times if you show these parents that you were there for that child and you want bet what's best for their child, they're going to communicate with you because – Nine times out of ten, that's what they want to. So an experience that I've had with that so far was um, when you take the time to listen to somebody and they're struggling with X, whatever X is, I had no idea the impact that I could make in someone's life that's not the kid by just saying, hey, what if you did this to make it happen? And it, you go from zero, they're not doing anything, to can we do that? Absolutely we can do that. And then action starts taking place and you start seeing progress being made. I mean, that's just you really— You showed them value. And, and, and I, it's little things like that it that really we is. can do to make a difference, which is going to change the life of that child. Mm -hmm. Because if you show that parent value and you show them what they are worth and what they can be for their that child, that's going to change that child's life. And you, in turn, have changed that child's story to one of hope. You know, sometimes uh, I have to remind myself, you don't know what you don't know until you know it. Um, something else that surprised me about this process is how many opportunities and services are available to people who want help that are willing to take care of it um, the case plan that um, was assigned had very detailed list of hey mom dad if you want to get your child back you got to do this 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 and this I mean it's black and white it's it's a road map if you if you follow this we can put that child back in your home um, so it's not 
it's not impossible for uh, someone who has done things that are not right in the past to uh, have redemption, to be able to put themselves on a path to do what's right by the kid and ultimately have a reunification of a household, get that child back in the household. So won't you tell us about some of the, uh, because the the whole parent thing was probably the most intimidating thing for me because I didn't want to come in and, you know, start asking a parent question. Child's been removed and um, you're trying to figure out what's happening. But that was really uh, put to rest right after the first meeting. Said, and, and you guys, coach, just do this to let us know we're here to do what's best for the child. That's it. We're, we're not here to cast judgment on anybody. We're here to do what's best for the child and give recommendations. We're not decision makers. We're here to be able to give the best advice based on the situation we have. So talk to us a little bit about kind of some of that parent interaction that you've seen uh, with some of the success stories. Well, like you said earlier, one of the things we really uh, drive on our training is to put your biases aside. It's not the way you would keep your house. It is not the way you would parent. It was, it's not the way you would dress your child. And you've got to put all that aside and look to see if their basic needs are met. And one thing that we really, we ask our volunteers is to compliment and encourage the parents as you can. Um, So many times they've isolated themselves from their family. Mm -hmm. They have no support. And that's when just a simple conversation between you and a parent can open that up can change that when you go you know i talked to your mom as a possible placement for the children and she really has been very concerned about you she would love to hear from you why don't you go and try to talk to her and see if y'all can work out something that she cares for the children while you work your case plan and then she will be a a means of support for you when you get the children back if you speak to them in positive tones and you let them know that you are there for that child they're going to do nine times out of ten they're going to do what is asked for them because they do love their children and they do want what's best for them they just don't know how yeah and sometimes you think well it's common sense You should know how to take care of a kid. They haven't had the life experiences we have. Yeah. Most most of them, uh, I wouldn't say most. I don't know the statistics. I would assume that many of the um, kids who end up in the foster care system, their parents came from a home that was not much better than what they're giving their current child. So they're emulating probably in a lot of cases what they know to be true and comfortable because this is how it was done when I was raised. And they think they're okay, so they think their children will be okay. Many times in this area, it is generational. Mm. They were in foster care, so they're not, you know, devastated by their children being in foster care. They'll get them back. Right. Because that's what happened with them. Sure. So we've got to break that cycle. And I think the way we break that cycle is when we are advocating for these children that we also encourage these parents. Yeah, I think it's a great way. put them in the right direction. We can't make anybody do anything, but encouragement is a great word to be able to use in this. Um, talk to us about, um, and I, you don't have to get very specific, but as, as just a kind of a, a general what do you think the success rate of a kid getting reun- uh, re- reunification happening when a cost is involved versus reunification when cost is not involved? Statewide statistics show that a child with a CASA is twice as likely to find a safe and permanent home than a child without a CASA. Mm. And so many times that is reunification. Uh, with their family because avenues have been explored. There's a safety plan in place that should things go off the track with the parents. Again, they have a safety plan. They have a plan of how they protect their child from whatever is going on in their life. And so it's just things that we believe are common sense and things that we do naturally. We show them how to prepare for the 
unseen, the unknown, prepare for things to break, to go wrong, to to mess up. I think it's and, great that you kind of pointed out it was um, uh, they're twice as likely to end up in a safe environment. And it's not always reunification. It may be into a um, an adoption uh, scenario. It may be guardianship with another family member. Correct. But it, but the child ends up is twice as likely to end up in a better place. Yes. With the cost of versus without. So some disappointing things that I've I've come across in, in this process, not with CASA, but it's about the system that we have. I, I'm not going to say that it's it's broken, but it's a system that is extremely overburdened to the point to where, I mean. Why has somebody not declared an emergency in this case? I can actually see how, um, how can I put this? I don't want to come across as being disparaging to people, but I could actually see how someone could work the system to get their child back and the child shouldn't go back into that home. I could see mm -hmm. that happening without an advocate. Um, I could see where there was an opportunity for that child to be able to be reunited reunified with the family and it not happened because that child was not being uh, no one was looking after the best interest of that child the system is so overworked um, I thought coming into this that you know it was just a pay problem because the the amount that that the caseworkers were getting was just not enough, but I'm finding out they get paid pretty well to do it. It's just the workload is so great. The workload is so great. They are, um, they're dealing with 40 children that they have to see face to face every month that they have to write reports for. Not only do they have to see that child, they have to make sure that the parents are taking their steps. Yeah. So they're like, they are, governing a they are overseeing an entire family unit right so it's not just that one child sure and it's not an eight to five job either no, so it's not. a child could law enforcement could remove a child from a home or uh, both parents are getting locked up for domestic or whatever the situation may be maybe a child neglect situation that's happening and that caseworker is called to take custody of, of this kid and if there's no foster home... Then they have to find a foster home. Yeah. And so if that's at 11 o'clock on a Sunday night, they're making calls to find that foster home. If they can't get anyone to commit that night, then that child sleeps at the office with that worker on the phone trying to find a placement for that child. And so many times children removed from this area are placed somewhere else mm -hmm. we have children in Shreveport we have children in Alexandria we have children in Plaquemine Parish because there was not a placement here and to put that in the context uh, not taking one thing away from the kids talk about the caseworker so this caseworker may have a family at home yes dinner plans that were laid out or family event that was happening. or a birthday party yeah oh. all of the above and you just can't take that kid to your family function with you uh, so they're they're there with that child until that child finds placement and talking to a lot of our uh, foster parents that that we know they get calls all the time and they, they just don't have the space or capacity for it and they say it gets to the point to where I feel so bad for having to say no, but I, I just, I can't. Physically, cannot do anymore. Our caseworkers are so overwhelmed, and there's such a large turnover. So we constantly have new people right out of college sure. who don't have the experience of our longer caseworkers who know how to encourage parents, who know how to, these people coming right out of college are just being thrown into it yeah. and expecting to juggle all this. And it's overwhelming. It is. And they are completely overworked. And that's why having a CASA on the case, because they can exchange mm. facts, yes. they can exchange information, she can say, uh, the CASA worker can say, when I went to the family visit, there was an uncle there from Mississippi that I've never seen before, and the children were afraid of him. That caseworker can go in and go, who was this uncle from Mississippi? 
I need a report on him and make sure that that man is safe to be around these children or not. Right. And, you know, we all know kids can act like they're, you know, embarrassed or uh, don't want to be around somebody sure. and it not be grounded. But so many times it is. Yeah. And we need to know all the facts. And that's something that a, a CASA volunteer observed, shared with a caseworker, and the caseworker investigated it. Right. CASA workers don't investigate it. We just report facts. We just report facts. We are fact gatherers, right. not fact givers. That's correct. We only give it to the judge. So, and that is, um, but it, that is a time when a CASA worker and a DCFS worker share information that turns out to be for the best interest of that child. Right. So when I had first interaction with our um, caseworker, which you guys did a great job preparing us, letting us know that they're they're overworked and overloaded. And had you not told me that in the beginning, I would have thought like, dang, does this person not care about anything? <laughs> uh, but truly, they are so overworked. And uh, we have met some fantastic caseworkers. So I don't want to come across as saying that our caseworkers are bad and state employees don't do what they're supposed to. They're just overworked. They and are. I, I don't know what the state I can't see how someone has not screamed from the rooftop to say they need some relief. Um, I mean, I would say they probably need twice Mm -hmm. or three times the amount of caseworkers here to be effective um, at a high level so that everybody's not overworked. Turnover there, you mentioned, is just so high. I would figure somebody would get the picture at some point. Well, you would think. (laughs) Well, but. Hopefully, maybe somebody with the state is going to watch this podcast and understand, <laughs> hey, maybe we ought to look at it a little bit closer on our employment. Uh, talk to us about some of the um, um, some of the wins, some of the um, – t- tell, give us an idea of what reunification really means to the child and um, seeing that process go through. Because it's not a short process. Uh, when we sign on, we're prepared for 18, possibly 24 months mm-hmm. – with this one case. So that's a big commitment to make up front. And it's a process you have to walk through. But when a parent takes the time to walk through the process, tell me about those experiences. Um, My very first case when I was a volunteer um, was uh, a little boy that had a black, went to kindergarten with a black eye, said that his mom's boyfriend gave it to him. So he was removed from the home. He was placed with a biological father and stepmother. Now, this child was born during that marriage. So when I got that information, I thought, "Mm, this is not probably not going to be the best placement for him. I was wrong. That was the best placement for him. But he kept being a problem in school. I mean, a big behavior problem. And he was smart as a whip, but he just could not behave. And there were meetings at school. Uh, Stepmom would go. Dad would go. Biological mom would go. Counselors, everyone went. I went. Everyone was all hands on deck. And one day, just the mom in me said, he's bored. He's not bad. He's bored. So they started testing him. And he is uh, in high school now in the Gifted and Talented program. Awesome. So that was a big win. Just, that need, was a just need to be challenged a little bit win. more, right? Yes. And that, that was a huge win for me. That's still my favorite, that he has got opportunities that otherwise might not have been afforded to him. Well, you know, the mentioned it earlier, the services that are available um, to, you know, kids that find themselves in this uh, circumstance – not only to the kids, but to the parents, the service that are available. And I, I had no idea the kind of the influence as a cost that we can have to say, you know what, we need this. This child needs X and we're going to keep pushing until you give that kid X. The foster parent, I think, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong here, but I feel the, the CASA has a little bit more influence than what the foster parent does in advocating for some things that that kid needs. Now, I know if it's like medical, if it's something urgent, pretty much get whatever but if if that if that uh foster parent is asking for counsel and it's not getting it it's foster parent can't go before the judge yeah 
They only deal with the caseworker. They can tell that caseworker what they want, what they believe is needed to their blue in the face. If the caseworker doesn't deem it necessary, right. it never goes before the judge. And then there again, it's not because the caseworker doesn't care about it. It's that where did this fall in the 40 other people that they're They've looking at? They've got so many boxes they have to check. They have to dot all the I's, cross all the T's. CASA volunteers' hands are not tied in that way. We are a more of a common sense approach sure. of why, why haven't we gotten this child some speech therapy? Why haven't we, why don't we have a, a 504 plan for this child? I, I believe he may be dyslexic. We, we can advocate for what we believe is the next best step sure. where we don't have to follow DCFS has to follow each little step. Correct. We can skip three. Right. We can skip three and make that recommendation to the judge. And we are so fortunate in our area that our judges believe in the mission of CASA. Mm. They believe yes. what our volunteers do. They are appreciative of our volunteers. And they read those court reports and they take to heart what those volunteers are recommending. And nine times out of ten... They're going to go with what the volunteer says. So let's talk about the class. So the class was not um, a, a burdensome thing for us. We got a little special treatment. Y'all, <laughs> y'all came to church. So on a Wednesday night, we, we had that. But normally, how do your classes go for volunteers? Typically, our classes are five weeks um, from 530 to 830 in our office in Monroe. Now, we train in all of our areas. So if you're in one of our outlying areas in like Providence or Tallulah or Columbia, um, all those trainings are different. But we are gathering up for a fall training right now where we, training is the most time restraint mm -hmm. you've got. After you do the five weeks of training, you can make being a CASA fit into your life. Uh, and I agree with that. So the the training, when uh, they told me the time commitment for the training, I was like, oh, I just don't want to give it that much time. Um, but I deemed it important enough, so so we did. So the training was very engaging. Um, it was... Um, you got a lot of information. You get a lot of information, but I don't want anyone to get scared about the information. It's... Um, the information is good, broad overview of kind of what's happening. There's nothing so detailed... Well, there's a couple of things that are very detailed, like um, you never, uh, you're never alone with a child. Right. You never transport child. You we never things... transport child. You never <laughs> transport a child. Or a family member. Or a family member. You. Um, we have things in place to protect yeah. the children and to protect our CASA volunteers. Right. And so I never felt at any time through the training that. I'm going to forget this. I'm going to forget this because it wasn't like that at all. You, you guys gave us a lot of information. The training was very engaging. It never came across boring. It's hard to keep my attention sometimes, but you guys did a, a great job. You can tell y'all have been doing it for quite some time. But you're right. The commitment after that, I think in the uh, documentation they say, you know, 10 to – uh, 20 hours uh, a month that you can spend. You can you can spend as much time as you want in it, or you can fit it into your life to where it's like not even really a hiccup in your weekly activities right. to be able to do. But the important thing is that you're you're making the monthly visits. You're you're documenting as much as you can. You guys make it easy with the uh, online system for us to document our notes in, and then. Um, We've already done our first court report, which I'm doing. Uh, we decided for my wife and I both to to work one CASA kid uh, as our first one, do it together. But the time commitment was not a strain on or hasn't been a strain on me or my wife. Uh, and you guys have done a fantastic job of well, holding our hand. We want to over-prepare you. We want yeah. to tell you that it's going to be 10 hours a month so that – if it's a difficult case sure. and there are 20 players in that child's life, 
that you're prepared for it. And I want you to know that, that our supervisor, and I'm sure it's like every everyone else that's up there, I don't want to speak for my experience, but anytime we need something, boom, she's there. Do you want me to go with you? Um, have you thought about this or have you asked this question? Let me know if you need anything. Hey, I just learned some information and I want you to know this. Uh, you guys will hold our hands through the entire process because you guys see the need, and the need is great in our community. Yes. We love on our volunteers. CASA would not be a program if it were not for the community connection, if it were not for our community stepping up and saying, yes, yeah. I'm going to stand up for a child. Um, all of our supervisors are that way. Um, they make that connection with their volunteers, and they want – them to succeed. They want their experience with our program to be something that they deemed um, important, that they felt like it was worth their time. Y'all are giving up your time and your energy and, and your prayers to this case, and we want you to feel like what you say matters. You know, I had a friend of mine, um, he called me up, and I just told him that I was going to handle something for cost. And he's like, well, well what is that? And I, I explained it to him. And his question to me wasn't, and it was coming from a seeking to understand question. It wasn't derogatory. It was like, why are you, why are you doing that? Um, and I said, great question. Thanks for asking. Because this individual is going to be the, the next generation within our community. Why would I not want to invest in the next generation Exactly. Of, of our community. And I would also like to know that, heaven forbid, something ever happened to me or Carla and our kids ended up in foster care, that I would have somebody that would advocate for what's best for my kids. Absolutely. So how, how can we not? It's a, it's such a small investment of time to, to pour into a kid that can make huge results and not just the kid but pour into that family unit to be able to um, make a huge difference that could be a generational difference that you're making within that family unit and that that could potentially spread amongst the people within their sphere and see the changes that they're making in their life it's the ripple effect mm. like you said a while ago that you had had a conversation with a biological dad yeah. that Initially, you, you thought, I don't know if this is going to fly or not. Well, you know, we, we all often hear that it's the breakup of the home. It's uh, the fatherless family unit that's out there. So I was shocked when I started seeing the response from biological dad, just because we kind of been been told for so many times that, that dads, they just, they just don't care anymore. It's a fatherless home, fatherless home that's out there. But man to man, yeah. you talked to him and you said, you know, dude, I think you can do this. If you start with this, I, you know, and you made a difference in his life, which is ultimately going to change that child's life. And so if, if we don't do it, who will? Yeah. And that's been my thing when I volunteered is if why not me? Sure. Why can't I do it? This podcast is possible because of your support of our real estate business. If you're looking to buy, sell or invest in real estate, I'm confident we have the tools and the processes to help you reach your real estate goal. For more information or to reach out to us, check out the podcast description for our contact info. Well, I think you guys are a blessing to our community. Um, I want people to know that come out of this that it is um, anyone. I don't care what your background is. It is not a difficult process. The, the most difficult part that I've experienced through this whole thing is saying yes to the class. That was the most difficult thing for me so far. But when I said yes, I, I'll transparent. I was nervous when we got assigned our first kid because I don't want to screw up somebody's life. And I know right. kid it's has a got, lot of responsibility, got trauma, but you guys have a plan laid out. You make it so easy for a volunteer to get plugged in, to be equipped and to, to make a change in our community one child at a time. So That's Leslie, it. thank you guys. And when you get back to the office, high five everybody for I me. Will. It is, um, 
it is an experience I'll never forget. And um, I'm still new within our case. And um, I am confident that we will see this case through. And uh, we look forward to where that next case is going to bring us. Now, for us, we only wanted one child uh, because we didn't want to overload ourselves with anything. Absolutely, because it was new. It was new. But as Acosta gets more experience and if they want to get more involved, there is opportunities. There, you have uh, some CASAs that have multiple kids uh, in multiple families, correct? Yes, we have some CASAs that do um, multiple cases. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we have some classes that do one case that has three children. And so she's advocating for all three of those children to bring that family unit back together, Correct. to get those three children in one placement so that at least whether they go back into that home of origin or not, they are together. And she advocates for visits between those children to keep that bond. So they're, I mean, you can pick and choose what you want to do. So do y'all have, like, a, what is the best online resource for someone who would like to uh, get more information? Just Go to our website, which is www.casaofneela.org, and just look through there. There's a scroll down to the bottom. We've got training dates coming available, and it click the volunteer button and fill out an application. You've got to pass a background check, a DCFS check that nothing, no accusations have been uh, you've been accused of anything with as far as children, um, a valid driver's license. You have to be 21 years old and go through the training, and that's if, it. If someone was like, yeah, I mean, it sounds good, but I don't want to sign up for training and waste my time or anybody else's time, if they just want to call and talk to you guys, is that? Absolutely, yes. And we have an interview before training starts so that we are all on the same page, that you understand what this vol- volunteer opportunity is yeah. and that we understand what you're looking to get out of it. Yeah, and, and you guys did that with us as well, even though we signed up to do a, a whole class together. I really like that. You set the expect you you guys did a great job setting the expectation up in the beginning, because I mean it takes a lot of time and effort to go through training with people. Uh, and I'm not trying to say you're weeding people out, but you want to let someone know uh, there's no bait and switch here. It's this is what what it is. This is what it's about. How do you feel about that? If you're like, yes, it sounds like something I want to do. Great, let's let's start taking to the next step. But so. we've had people who've gone through three, four classes of the training and then step back and go, I've got some unresolved issues from my childhood or this is not what I thought it was going to be. I'm going to bow out. And that's fine. We don't want you involved in this if this is not where your heart is. Yeah, I I agree with that. You guys did a great job of that. So um, thank you for for just putting y'all's yes on the table. I know that it has to be um, I know it's a rewarding, but also know that it has to be taxing at some level with you guys um, constantly um, um, hearing the negativity that is uh, within our community where, where it's affecting kids. But I don't look at it like that. I look at it as that you guys are the hope. You're the hope for our community. You're the hope for our youth. And um, I know that this program makes our community a better place. So Thank you. I think so, too. Thank you so much for coming in and just talk to us. Thanks for having me, Brian. Thanks. Take care. Thank you for taking the time to watch or listen to this podcast. We really appreciate your involvement. Please leave us a comment or even better yet, subscribe to this podcast and hit that notification bell so that you can be alerted for every new episode when it hits. Mm -hmm.